In this PowerPoint, we'll continue to discuss reaction stoichiometry by looking at limiting reactant situations. So chemical reactions show the exact ratio of reactants needed. But what happens when you don't have the exact ratios? For example, the coefficients in this balanced chemical equation for the synthesis of hydrogen chloride gas indicates that you need one molecule of hydrogen for every one molecule of chlorine to produce two molecules of hydrogen chloride gas. But what if I don't have a one-to-one -one ratio of hydrogen and chlorine? What if I have six molecules of hydrogen and four of chlorine? How many hydrogen chloride molecules can I expect to make in this situation? This is the heart of a limiting reactant problem. Let's look at another food analogy first. We're making cheese sandwiches with exactly one slice of cheese and two slices of bread for each sandwich. Here's my recipe. Now say I go to the cabinet and I find that I have 28 slices of bread and 11 slices of cheese. How many cheese sandwiches can I make? Using my recipe ratio of one slice of cheese per two slices of bread, I'm going to run out of cheese long before I run out of bread. I can make 11 sandwiches and I'll still have six slices of bread left over. In reaction terms, we would say that cheese is the limiting reactant. It limited the total amount of sandwiches we could make. Bread was the excess reactant because we had more than enough. Now let's return to our chemical recipe. In this scenario, we can also apply our ratios from the chemical equation. And one molecule of chlorine for every one molecule of hydrogen gas suggests that we don't have enough chlorine present to react with all of the hydrogen gas that's there. In other words, chlorine will be our limiting reactant and hydrogen will be our excess. And we can use stoichiometry to actually predict how much hydrogen chloride gas will form because the amount of our limiting reactant limits the amount of product formed. We start with it and we use the coefficients from the balanced chemical equation, one chlorine, for every two hydrogen chloride to convert from chlorine to hydrogen chloride gas molecules. So we should have eight hydrogen chloride gas molecules. And of course, since we didn't use up all of our excess reactant, we're also going to have two hydrogen molecules left over. So here's another example of a limiting reactant problem. How many moles of carbon dioxide can be made from 1.20 moles of C8H18, which is octane, and 2.00 moles of molecular oxygen in the combustion reaction given here? The key to recognizing this as a potential limiting reactant problem is the fact that we're given the amounts of two or more reactants as starting points. We have amounts for both octane and oxygen, both on the reactant side. It means that we don't know which will be the limiting reactant, and we'll have to figure that out as part of the problem. So any time that you're given amounts of two or more reactants, you have a limiting reactant situation. Now the ratios in the chemical reaction here are a little more complicated than the previous example, and it may not be clear just by comparison which of our reactants we have in excess and which one is limiting. The best solution in this case is to do a stoichiometry calculation for each reactant amount to determine which will produce the smallest amount of product. So we're going to do two conversions, one starting with 1.20 moles of octane and the other with our other given amount, 2.00 moles of oxygen. For both of these conversions, we're going to find the same thing, the amount of moles of carbon dioxide. Now, this is going to tell us for each of these the amount of moles of carbon dioxide that could be produced if all of that reactant were used up. In other words, if all of that reactant were the limiting reactant. So the limiting reactant is always going to be the one that actually gives us the smallest amount of product.
because it suggests that we will use up that particular reactant long before the other one. Let me show you how this actually works. We'll start with our conversion for octane. We want to cancel out octane, so we use the coefficient for octane from the balanced chemical equation in the denominator. We want to get moles of carbon dioxide, so we use the coefficient for carbon dioxide in the numerator. Moles of octane cancel out. 1.20 times 16 divided by 2 gives us 9.60 moles of carbon dioxide. In order to produce this much carbon dioxide, we would have to use up all of that octane. Now, let's look at oxygen. This time we want to cancel out oxygen, moles of oxygen, so we use the coefficient from the balanced chemical equation for oxygen. And again, we want to figure out how much of our product would be formed, so that's CO2, so we use the same numerator, 16 moles of CO2. Moles of oxygen cancel out. 2 times 16 divided by 25 gives us 1.28 moles of carbon dioxide. So this is much less than the amount of carbon dioxide that could be produced if we used up all of our octane. What this indicates is that we're going to use up all of our moles of oxygen before we reach that larger amount. So oxygen is going to be our limiting reactant. The smaller of the two amounts, of the two product amounts that you get from your two stoichiometry calculations in a limiting reactant problem is always the answer. 1.28 moles of carbon dioxide is the amount of CO2 that can be formed in this reaction. And the reactant that gives you that amount, your starting point, that's always the limiting reactant. So here's another example. How many grams of nitrogen gas, N2, can be made from 9.05 grams of ammonia gas reacting with 45.2 grams of copper 2 oxide? This time, we're given our starting amounts in grams, but I can still recognize this as a limiting reactant situation because I'm given amounts for two or more reactants. Both ammonia and copper 2 oxide are on the left-hand side of the arrow. I have to do a stoichiometry calculation for each reactant amount, but this time I need to convert from grams of each reactant into grams of our product. So each of these conversions is going to be a mass-to-mass -mass stoichiometry conversion. And what that means is that I start by dividing by the molar mass of each of my reactants. So starting with ammonia, one nitrogen and three hydrogens add up to 17.03 and grams for one mole, since that's a molar mass. My grams of ammonia will cancel out. I'll be left with moles of ammonia. My next step is to convert to moles of nitrogen using the coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. And it's two ammonia for every one nitrogen. So that's a one to two ratio. My moles of ammonia cancel out. I'll be left with moles of nitrogen. I do need to figure out grams or mass of nitrogen, so I can convert from moles of nitrogen to mass of nitrogen using the molar mass of N2, which is 28.02 grams. The moles cancel out, and I'll be left with 7.45 grams of nitrogen. So that's the amount of nitrogen that could be produced if all of that ammonia present reacted away. Now, let's see what happens for the copper 2 oxide. We're going to cancel out grams of copper 2 oxide first by dividing by the molar mass. One copper and one oxygen gives us a molar mass of 79.55 grams for every one mole. And the grams of copper 2 oxide cancel out. We next need to convert from copper 2 oxide to nitrogen using coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. So it's three moles of copper 2 oxide for every one mole of nitrogen. Again, just using the coefficients for the balanced chemical equation. Oops, 
my moles of copper two oxide cancel out, and then I want to cancel out my moles of nitrogen and convert that to grams. So again, I use the molar mass of nitrogen, N2, and I multiply that this time. So moles of N2 cancel out. I multiply through by everything on top, divide by everything on bottom, and I find that I have 5.31 grams of nitrogen that could be formed if all of that copper two oxide reacts away. And since the amount that could be formed from the, all of the copper two oxide reacting is less than the amount that could be produced from the ammonia reacting, copper two oxide is the limiting reactant. The smaller of the two amounts is always the answer. And it also means that copper two oxide is my limiting reactant. Another term that you're going to hear in stoichiometry problems is product yield. There are actually three different types of product yield in stoichiometry. The first is what we call theoretical yield. It's the amount of product predicted by the stoichiometry calculation. So that means all of the amounts that we've been calculating for our limiting reactant problems in the previous examples are theoretical yields because they are calculated based upon the starting points and the conversion factors from the stoichiometry coefficients of the balanced chemical equation. There's a big difference though between the amount that you predict that should be formed from your calculations and the amount that is actually recovered in the laboratory. So actual yield is the amount of product that's actually recovered. And a lot of things could happen. You could accidentally spill some of your product. You could have had a side reaction or something that happened after your reaction that actually consumed some of the product. Or perhaps there was a contaminant in your uh, reaction process and that increased the mass of the product so that it actually seemed like you produced more product than you should have. So it's very rare that your actual yield equals your theoretical yield. And we can characterize the difference between our actual and our theoretical yield using a percent yield. And this is simply the actual yield divided by the theoretical yield times 100. Let's look at another food analogy to illustrate this concept. My favorite cookie recipe says it yields five dozen cookies. Every time I make it though, I only get four dozen. In chemical reaction terminology, the predicted yield based upon recipe amounts is my theoretical yield. What I actually get in my kitchen is the actual yield. I can calculate the percent yield for this recipe for me as actual over theoretical times 100, or four dozen divided by five dozen times 100. In this case, 80%. This cookie recipe always gives me an 80% yield. So we can apply the idea of theoretical yield to some of our previous stoichiometry problems as well. For example, we've already done this particular problem. We defined what we were given and trying to find, and we realized that we were given amounts for two reactants, which made this a limiting reactant scenario. We did two stoichiometry conversions for each of our reactant amounts, and we chose the smaller of the two amounts as the amount of nitrogen that could be produced in this situation. This was our answer. Because this is based upon stoichiometry calculations of given amounts and coefficients from the balanced chemical equation, this is our theoretical yield. In order to calculate percent yield, we would need one more piece of information. You must also measure, or in this case, be given an actual yield amount. So say that you were then told that 5.00 grams of nitrogen were recovered from this combination. You could calculate the percent yield then as actual over theoretical times 100. Your actual yield is 5.00 grams of nitrogen. 
Divide that by the amount that you got from the calculations, 5.31 grams of nitrogen times 100, and it would give you a percent yield of 94.2%. Let's look at one last example. In the following balanced chemical reaction, 10.4 grams of arsenic, AS, reacts with 11.8 grams of sulfur, S, to produce 14.2 grams of diarsenic trisulfide, AS2S3. What is the percent yield of this reaction? So in this problem, we're actually given three amounts. And we're asked to find the percent yield, which we know is actual over theoretical yield times 100. So out of these three amounts, one must actually be the yield, the actual yield. So we look at the identity of the substances that we're given, and we find arsenic is actually a reactant. It's on the left-hand side. Sulfur is also a reactant, which means that our diarsenic trisulfide is our product. And the product is always the actual yield. All right, so um, what we need to do here is a stoichiometry calculation to figure out the theoretical yield that we can substitute into this, since we now have the actual yield that we can put in the, into the top. Since we're given two amounts of reactants, this is a limiting reactant situation, and we have to do a stoichiometry calculation starting with each reactant and determine the smaller amount of product that can be formed from those two calculations. That will be the theoretical yield that we can substitute into this equation. So let's start with our stoichiometry. So we'll start with the 10.4 grams of arsenic, convert that into moles. This is a mass to mass problem since everything is in grams. So we'll convert to moles by dividing by the molar mass of arsenic, which is 74.92 grams. Our grams of arsenic will actually cancel out. We'll be left with moles of arsenic that we need to convert into AS2S3, diarsenic trisulfide, using the coefficients from the balanced equation. That's two moles of arsenic for every one mole of the diarsenic trisulfide. Moles of arsenic will cancel out. And then we just want to convert from moles of AS2S3 into grams using the molar mass. So this time we multiply by the mass number so that our moles cancel out. And we get 17.1 grams of diarsenic trisulfide that could be formed if all of our arsenic were used up. Let's do the same thing for the sulfur as our starting point. We will convert into moles of sulfur by dividing by the molar mass. So grams of sulfur actually cancel out. We convert from moles of sulfur to moles of diarsenic trisulfide, our product, using the coefficients from the balanced chemical equation. So three moles of sulfur for every one of diarsenic trisulfide. Our moles of sulfur will cancel out. And we need to convert from moles of AS2S3 into grams using the molar mass. So we multiply by the molar mass so that our moles of diarsenic trisulfide cancel out. And we get 30.2 grams of AS2S3. So the smaller of these two amounts is going to be our theoretical yield. And we're going to substitute that into our percent yield calculation. 14.2 as our actual, 17.1 grams as our theoretical yield, times 100 gives us 83%. In summary, when we don't have reactants in the exact ratio prescribed by the balanced chemical equation, it's known as a limiting reactant situation. And you have to do a stoichiometry calculation to figure out the amount of product potentially formed from each reactant amount. The least amount of product predicted from these calculations is the theoretical yield of the reaction, the amount that can be produced. The starting reactant that gives you the least amount is the limiting reactant. The other reactant is the excess reactant. The actual yield of a reaction is likely different than the theoretical yield, 
and we can calculate percent yield as actual divided by theoretical times 100.